All right, well, thank you for watching us. It's um, now the discussion segment of the program, New Dawn, this Monday morning. One of the trending issues in Africa at the moment, um, especially West Africa, is the issue of um, uh, the coup in the um, Nigeria Republic. Um, although the United Nations and the ECOWAS are coming to it and uh, they have uh, taken a decision, um, you know, trying to force the uh, reinstatement of the president of the country, Mohamed Bazoum, to office. Uh, but for us, we want to look at, um, we want to look beyond this, we want to look at um, the place of coups in Africa, you know, how they affect um, entrenchment of uh, democratic um, rule. Uh, on the continent, and that's why this morning we have uh, joining us in the studio two brilliant gentlemen to look at this topic. Our immediate right is um, Dr. Bola Babalola of the Mashud Abiola Polytechnic here in Abiokuta. Dr. Babalola, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. We also have with us uh, Ustaz Jibril Awa, public affairs analyst, uh, here this morning. Ustaz, good morning. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, and viewers. Good morning to all of us. Good morning. Um, let's start with Dr. Abalola. Uh, who's they are, they are not strange, uh, you know, to Africa. Now this one has come and it appears um, it's a strange thing. Is it because um, uh, <laughs> democracy is um, has completely become the order of the day on the continent, or there is something you know unique about what has happened in Niger? Uh, good morning. Nigeria, good morning, Africa. Good morning, the whole world. Our coup is not, a, it's not only limited to Africa. I think some of all these uh, South American countries, in the past, <laughs> they were ruled by military junters. Uh, when you look at the unfolding scenario in, in this part of the world, in the West uh, Africa sub-region, uh, we should first and foremost ask ourselves how many of the countries in this uh, sub-region under the military regime? I don't think it's only the, the recent one in Niger. Then, let us look at uh, the happenstances in some of these countries before the military take over. More, more often than not, we only try to treat the matter when it gets to the climax. And uh, listening to some of these uh, coup uh, plotters, they presented, uh, while I'm not uh, supporting a coup, uh, for we all believe that uh, the worst of the military, uh, of the civilian government, is better than the best of the military regime. But those issues that prompted the military to take over, well, I, I think uh, in Africa we need to look at it first and foremost. And uh, thank God that uh, we have a strong leadership in the, in the ECOWAS now. And the kind of uh, steps being taken now by the leaders in the ECOWAS is, is a clear departure from what used to be in the past when military took over in the sub-region. Uh, aside this, this Boys, these military boys in Niger, nearby Niger. Uh, I would like the leaders of the ECOWAS and all those the EU to tell caution. I don't see them as the only one fighting now. It is possible they have uh, some uh, underneath uh, sponsors who are even outside the continent of Africa. And uh, the this is not perfect. Let's look at the, the availability of the natural resources uh, in this uh, Niger, uh, the uranium. Maybe the, you know, the point of interest by these uh, external bodies. Uh, thank God that the, the, the boys have been given seven days' notice. Let's look at, and I know that uh, before the expiration of that seven days, matters will have been resolved here and there. For nobody, nobody prays for uh, internal war in that country. And when there's an internal war, other issues will come in. Those who are on the sideline, the mercenaries, the external investors and scavengers, they may come in. That's why I want to plead with the 
the two sides, both the ECOWAS, the EU, and the military junctas in the J, to find a meeting point, a, a, a middle way of resolving the issue. Mm. Niger, if there's war in Niger, naturally um, the echoes will get to Nigeria, no doubt about it. But uh, we'll start beyond, beyond all this. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about the, this coup in Niger is the fact that um, President Bazoum was actually, uh, you know, detained by his own guard. His own guard. Um, although uh, they got support from from the military, from some, I think the, the military in Niger is also divided, you know, on this matter. But could it also mean that um, the president has, um, you know, must have actually messed up a whole lot of things for his own guard to detain him? I mean, his own guard is supposed to be loyal to him, but his own guard was the one that actually detained him. Oh, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> let me take it from where doctor stopped in an attempt to attend to your, your poser. Uh, first and foremost, it, um, I don't envy President Bolame Tinobu um, as the president of, um, or the chairman, or whatever they call it, of a, a COAS, that um, at this point in time, when he has a battle at home, mm. he needs to face such a you know, big one too in, in the, sub, in the uh, subcontinent of um, Africa, which is West Africa, which he belongs to. Um, I don't envy him. Uh, the fact remains that uh, it's a very complex case. Niger is a very complex case for everybody involved. Uh, because of the lot of powers, which Dr. Azikoli mentioned, uh, I'll get there. Um, quickly before I take your question, let's look at the fact that the, um, the Americans were, let's say, banished or sent out of uh, Mali, you know, their base, and um, eventually they have to come to Niger. So in Niger, we have two foreign <coughs> military bases for France and also for uh, the Americans. So suddenly, this is coming up in, in, in Niger. So it's not really shocking that um, the VP, Vice President of uh, the US, had to make a call, put a call through to the President of Nigeria, who happens to be the chairman of the uh, COAS. Uh, and also, there have been a lot of uh, flurry of activities coming from the US. And we cannot take away the hands of Russia in this, with the Wagner Group, uh, which is equally related to your question. I'll get there. Um, with the Wagner Group, we can't take away you know, their influence and their impact. And that's why it has not been easy for Putin to know what to do uh, with uh, the Wagner, um, um, you know, um, the guy at the end of the Wagner, Wagner Group. Because you know, when, when you look at what he did, with, with the, the threat he, he posed, about three weeks ago to Russia, and you would have thought that uh, Putin would get him arrested and um, you know, kill him. But he was not assassinated, he was not killed. Rather, he was given a softer landing you know, to go to a neighboring uh, state and help them to train their military. So Wagner remains you know, a potent tool in the hand of Putin. So he can't really you know, um, deal with him the way people thought he would have done. Now, when you look at what happened in, the, in, in, the, in, in Niger, you will not be shocked the kind of kitchen cabinet our president in Nigeria brought up from the military point of view. Quite a number of those that are his personal guards now, when you go back to that list, are people he feels he could trust. They are from his tribe. They are of Yoruba tribe. Go and look at it. Uh, the person in charge of Amori, uh, the person in charge of the brigade of guard, working within the Asso Rock. You understand that. And there may be discourse of things like this that you realize that you need people that you need to support him in case mm. uh, things like need to come up. But in Niger, yes, what happened is not shocking. Strategists, don't forget that whatever, no matter how strong or how weak you want to look at a military of any nation, they remain military men, they, they remain soldiers, who have gone through series of courses. And it therefore means that when they want to approach anything, that military training they had will always have a role to play. They need to look at their strength. You just said it. And which is a fact that the Niger army is divided. And for you to want to stage such a thing, that you want to be successful and as bloodless as you can afford to be, it has to be people that have quick access, you know, to the stronghold of the president, which is the, um, you know, the seat of government, which whatever they may call it there, uh, which is what is happening. What, what happened in, in Gambia 
what happened in uh, which other country in, in the Ako was just happening to live and they, they left was because there was the, the, the people that took up government, the coupists, realized that um, they don't have such a strength to prevent you know, the seat of government from being taken out from them. So that's why they quickly negotiated a way out for themselves. So that's what has happened. They need to get you know, the support of the immediate guards of the president if they want the coup to succeed and as flawless as they can afford to be. But you're not saying that doesn't mean that the president was not performing. No. When it comes to issue of you want to get you out, that issue of betrayal, anything goes. Because it's the, it's the player of the, the ISB that gets it all. We don't know the kind of offer they've given to these guards for them to have done what they did. We don't know what they've done. I want to look at the responses that came there after. The French uh, flag being burnt and the um, Russian flag being hosted, etc. Realize that there is more to the issue in Niger than we are looking at it. But I've been able to persuade the immediate guards of the president, which a common has tagged at no stage, will be an issue because of whatever they might have offered them. It's, a, it's an issue of betrayal. And when the person wants to betray you, loyalty doesn't come in depends on what they want to give to you. Mm. So we don't know what they have been offered mm. that make them to do what they've done. But you know, we'll be going forward in the course of the program, look at what, what is the way out. But the way things are now, it's really, really complex for ECOWAS. It's, com it's a complex thing for ECOWAS. And they, they've come out, a strong statement, a strong action. But I didn't see them being able to want to do what they did with ECOMOG in those years. I don't see them being able to do that. What I think might, might, might work out, because now even the population, the civilian population in Niger seems to be in favor of what is happening. And we've seen them taking to the streets, supporting what has happened, went ahead to burn the headquarters of um, uh, the ruling party there. So it's suggesting that even the civil populace seems to want to, you know, seems to be in support of whatever is happening there, with a lot of reasons. Mm. One of, some of the younger generation we have now are people that never experienced military rule. Is that when you talk of Nigeria, mm -hmm. quite a number of people that shout on social media now mm -hmm. did not witness the civil, the military rule. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So you can, that's why you can afford to have them going to the mm -hmm. military headquarters in Abuja mm -hmm. saying they want the military to take <laughs> over because they never know what it means. Mm -hmm. There are young people that just came up, mm -hmm. no experience of what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. The same thing is happening across, you know, West mm -hmm. Africa. Okay, today, all right, uh, I would like to ask you, Stars, to take it off from here. The sanctions have been rolled out, most of which are economic sanctions on, on, on Nigeria Republic. Do you think that these sanctions are enough? Um, there are two things. Um, the sanctions will be enough because when you look at Nigeria in itself, don't forget that about uh, two, two years ago, we had issue in Nigeria when Nigerian president, uh, former president, um, paid about one point something billion to buy vehicles, operational vehicles for the government of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it therefore means that they have problems. America every year is supporting their budget over 500 million US dollars. So they have issues. There is no doubt about that they have issues. Now, the J is equally landlocked. So when, when, when you block, if the land, land border closure is effective, and I don't know how ECOWAS wants to do it, or how, I mean, um, ECOWAS wants to do it, to, to have air blockade. Because you need military power to do air blockade. You know, you need to roll in the Air Force to do air blockade. So if they're able to implement the land closure and the air blockage effectively well, I see problem coming up within Niger. Because no, nothing will be able to go in. They are landlocked. There is no sea. So if all other African countries actually and really supported this and they're able to block it. And when you look at Niger, what is Niger to, what is Niger's economic value to a nation like Nigeria? They don't have that much economic value. Maybe the, the, the cow or whatever they, that comes in from there. So it's going to have real impact on them ec economically. That, 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 that is the belief. And that's why they realize that they need to go for the jugular and do it. Once. If, they can, so if they can succeed in blocking the land border, as ECOWAS have said, and able to block the air using air blockade, bringing in superior military powers to ensure that is done, then I see them wanting to, like, look, let's negotiate. All right, Dr. Avala, it's. Um the, the, when the, mili uh, the military junta took over power, the people were e elated. Obviously, we saw clips of them celebrating on the streets. And um, is this an indication that one, probably the government in power is not in favor of the common man in Niger, or that um, 
they don't really know much about what its negative impact mm -hmm. of military in government. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my brother here mentioned something that uh, most of our younger generations, the social media generation, they don't know anything about military. Hmm? They don't. The way they will behave, if a military take over in any country, say in Africa, be different from how elders like us will look at it. Be uh, having said that, look at the history of military coup in Africa. When the military take over, that's the normal <laughs> response. They will say Osana today, crucify him tomorrow. Look at Libya. You are you are you are a living witness. Look at uh, Saddam uh, uh, Iraq. Look at Ghana. Look at Congo. When the military took over, that's the normal response. You, you and uh, I want you to also consider it that most of these people, burning, looting, may even be sponsored uh, agents of the state to create an impression that the people are in support of the coup. If we go to the, to the grassroots and interview the common man, they may have a different uh, view about the coup. So the, the fact that you see people on the social media, see people on television and this and that, rejoicing and dancing, they may not be rejoicing that the military is taking over. They may be rejoicing that maybe one or two of their enemies or opponents <laughs> were being pushed out of power. And when you look at the Arab Spring, as happened in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Egypt yes. what is that called? People first celebrated on the street, but a few months after that, what happened? The citizen return back to status quo. So you don't use that as a yardstick <laughs> that the, the military coupists, they are acceptable to the people, not at all. Mm. But, but let, let's take this uh, discussion outside of Nigeria now. Mm. Let's, let's uh, take it a lot uh, wider. Um, I think the coups are not particularly traditional in Africa anymore mm. um, in, 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 in contemporary age. But it was traditional in those days, in the 70s, 60s, up to the 80s, 80s and all that. But what signal does this send to civilian governments in all over Africa? Um, because um, people will say that the cost of governor, the cost of democracy, um, is um, ha naturally higher than the cost of a military regime. You know, when you have military regime, you don't have state assembly, you don't have national assembly. There are no SAs, there are no SSAs. The cost of governance is narrowed down. You don't think it starts. These are the things that anger people, you know, and, and make them feel that, you know, these civilians should just go. We need a military, um, a military man in charge, you know. And they've also seen some examples of some um, countries in Africa where, you know, a military regime spearheaded their revolution. Like in Ghana, we had uh, Jerry Rollins. When Rollins came in, you know, it was a complete turnaround for Ghana. You know, maybe that is the feeling in Nigeria. Maybe that is the feeling in some other parts of Africa, you know, going forward. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, Rollins, then Thomas Sankara, Sankara. people mm -hmm. like that. Yes. We can't take that away. But it, like I've said here, I love my this engagement here. The military is another political party in Africa or in West Africa. I have said it. Not even West in Africa and then, um, you know, Asian, um, American, Latin America, when you want to look at it, the military and that political party. I said it here. Um, it's either, you know, they want to stay back in their barracks and watch what is happening and pray for the civilians to make mistakes so they come over and take power using the, the, the toil of the gun to, to, to do that. that. That's what I've noticed. So the military have always been there. They've always been looking out for opportunity to come in. It's not just really new. That's, and like Dr. Equally and the all of us have seen that too. That, but when they come up, it doesn't change things as much. Um, we just have the opportunity for them to get a taste of what is going on or being sponsored. But going, go, going forward, taking it from your question, you see, there was a new surge of democracy 
all over Africa, everybody becoming democratically, you know, oriented, new government coming up and everyone will find it is good. But don't forget that the enemies are still there. They are locking in. And eventually when they had issues, the so-called civilian government had issues, those, we need to ask questions, why are they having issues? The foreign powers are still there. They are making things so difficult for quite a number of leaders. So that's why the, the challenges will remain uh, the, the way it, 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 it has been. Now, talking about the cost, it depends on the kind of cost you are looking at. When you look at the financial cost of a democratic government, yeah, it is huge. But don't forget that it opens more opportunities. The so-called cost talk about opens more opportunities for people. Um, no matter how terrible it is, when you bring a democratic system you know, of governance into a place, quite a number of people have the opportunity of participating. You know, quite a number of people from the grassroots, from everywhere, has the opportunity of participating. But there's also the argument, sorry to cut into stars, of yeah. abuse, you know, abuse um, of such powers in such a way that uh, because people see how the resources of their country or their state are used, you know, and uh, they also have because I, 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 I had an engagement with some people somewhere and they said, uh, I mean, they like what is going on in Nigeria, you know, uh, you know I mean, in, in democratic rule, in, in, in Nigeria, for instance, we've seen situations where some state governors, um, you know, appointed uh, um, special advisors, special assistants who don't have offices. And all they do is to just wait for a lot at the end of the month. They don't have offices, they're not functional, you know, at the end of the month. They, they take home uh, a lot of money, and, um, and all, there are other sectors of uh, that state that are, you know, begging for attention, investment uh, from government. I'll, I'll come in this way. Yeah. When we look at the number of years Nigeria was under the military, and the number of years you have been under the civilian rule, which one are we going to prefer? For those of us that witnessed it, mm. we will prefer definitely the civilian rule, and I'll tell you why. A bachelor within three or four years or so that he was there as head of state was able to embezzle humongous amount of money <laughs> that nobody under the military, under the civilian distinction could match. So when you talk of abuse, the abuse was more under the military because it's a military thing, it's a fiasco. They do whatever they want to do, as a fiat rather, mm -hmm. whatever they want to do and nobody is questioning them. The abuse under General Mahmoud, I mean, Babangida IDB was more than the abuse we had under the so-called Shagari regime. Mm -hmm. Go and look at it. So when you want to say you want to make comparison between military and say there is an abuse, there is more uh, there, the, the military is more prone to abuse than the civilian. Because somewhere along the line, people will see challenge. Look at for instance, Serap kept on taking, you know, the government to court. Challenging mm -hmm. Chal kept on challenging. Who could, who, who could have challenged under military? The under military. And some people also say they that they lie. The law, some people have also coined another one. They said benevolent military rule. I want to look at it. The <laughs> nine, when people talk and said freedom, 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 that, that the, 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 the freedom even on that bacha was better than what we have now because of the military. I said, if you don't know what you're talking about, why look mm. at them? They are generation Z or whatever you call them. Gen Z. Gen Z. They don't know what, what you're talking about. When we look at what led to the creation of people like Tom Polo, like, um, I want to say the public sector. They were a victim, they were a product of the problem we had with Ambacha, the way he handled the Ogonina. Mm. Because Sarua was saying, no, let us sit down and negotiate. Let us sit down around round, round table. But Abacha went on to say no and, and mm -hmm. he killed them, mm -hmm. despite all the intervention. We look at all these things over time. The, the murder of the Delegiwa the, the and, you know, etc. Quite a number of things happened. You won't say no, you want it to happen. It was a guest sample kind of rule when we had the military, which is different now. We can ask questions. No matter how bad it is, we can question people, we can, you know, we can bring them, say, come, come and give accountability of what you have done. But under the military, that was not really possible. So we have a lot of independence of the organs of government. Yes, there's an abuse. Yes, there is corruption. When we talk about this corruption, the corruption is not because the, the people are not involved. The corruption is pro people. And that's the truth. You see, we have corruption in Nigeria under the civil system because the people too wanted corruption. And that's the truth. Some people have often said that um, uh, almost all Nigerians are corrupt because um, uh, issues become corruption when um, you know, they don't favor you. But when they favor you, they become connection. Mm. 
you know. So it's connection versus corruption. Uh, is that it for you, Dr. Uh, Obalola? Yeah, you know, <laughs> we, before the camera was switched on, uh, I mentioned something. I said, cool happens everywhere, even in your home. Your children and your wife, they can plan coup against you. <laughs> Domestic coup. Yes. <laughs> in your offices, you see coup taking place every day. At the petrol station, the petrol attendants and the dealers, they plan coup against Nigerians. Are, the coup is still ongoing. So <laughs> having said that, you discover that uh, the issue of corruption, it depends on, the, on where you stand to look at an issue before you say, this is corruption, this is not corruption. Let's start from the issue of uh, the voters and the politicians. At the polling booth, you see somebody distributing 20 naira, 200 naira, a charge card, uh, ATM card. What do you call that one? We, such people, come up tomorrow and point a kitchen figure at the the politicians, those in power, accusing them of being corrupt. So those are the issues. A, a parent who takes his uh, word or her word to the exam center where such a child can be taught, dictated to, not the examination. What do you call that one? So the issue of corruption is everywhere even in America, <laughs> it is so-called the uh, bastion of democracy. But the problem we have here is that within the governmental circle, when you see corruption, people who think it will soon come to their turn, they will not call it corruption. No quality connection. Yes. <laughs> and uh, here in this part of the world, our leaders are not accountable. And nobody is ready to challenge the powers that be. Only a few people dare the lion in their dens. Even the CSO, the civil society organizations today, they, everybody just looking for connection. And uh, the other time you were talking about the NSC, I said, the NSC, OK. NSC of the Sumanu, Baba Sumanu. Pascal Baspiao. This uh, NSC of uh, Oshio Mali is not the NSC of today. Oh, that uh, is like going to be a strike giving notice to the government. The government will call you, let us meet somewhere. By the time those people are coming out, they will change the, uh, the analogy, they will change the story at the end of the day. This is big so, allegation. Uh, no, no, no. Doctor, this is, uh, yeah, listen to me, I'm not uh, <laughs> laying any allegation against anybody. This is what we are being. We have been witnessing Nigeria. Mm. It's, an, uh, it's, it's an open secret. Uh, too much noise, superfluity of nothingness. We come out of it. At the end of the day, uh, let me say it in Yoruba. At the end of the day, some people will smile and uh, some people will still be grumbling. So, as far as I'm concerned, the issue of corruption starts from individuals before it becomes. A, a societal matter. So if you don't want corruption, let us sit down and examine our individual private and public attitude. How does it affect the interest of others? How does it affect the progress of my society? How does it affect the joy and peace of others? If my attitude, my character, my behavior, whether in private or in public, bring smile, bring peace, bring joy, and fairness and justice to everybody, or it denies them what is their legal entitlement, I should look at that. So before I can say, OK, I'm corrupt, I'm not corrupt. Thank you. All right, and so Dr. Babala, I'd like <coughs> to stay with you. Now, if in, in the last, I mean, two, three years, we've seen a um, couple of coups in Africa, in West Africa, mm. specifically. We had Mali before this Niger Republic came up. Do you want to advocate for 
what kind, kind of reform do you want to advocate in um, Africa's um, democratic setting mm. that would need for stop cool yeah. now uh, we start said something the other time most of these countries witnessing coup in in recent times nobody is looking at the hands of the western part most of these countries have foreign military bases then we can simply conclude Ajekula no Mokuloni or Iromiton Juluriomi Unibe Wansale. Therefore, what can simply conclude that uh, this coup or these actions, the military actions, have foreign backings? The only way to stop military coup, one of the ways, let me say one of the ways. Number one, let the government be a government of the people indeed a government for the people indeed let us eliminate we against they that's what we are witnessing in in this part of the world before the election you see the man contesting begging everybody like everybody you can come to our house and eat garlic uh, drink garlic with us go to the the roadside and buy corn after the election. He will change his phone line. He will make himself even incommunicado, only accessible to one or two people. You want to talk to somebody who is in power, you say, go and see my CP, go and see my civil staff, go and see that. And when a benefit is coming, it's only given to the so-called party men to share. Recently, during the, the campaign, one civilian came, one uh, uh, contestant came to my neighborhood. I said, sir, I want to talk. Everything you have been giving to people in this neighborhood goes to this your party men. I pointed to them. This is your local government chairman, part, uh, party chairman, this, uh, this and that. They were looking at me. And they normally share it in their homes give it to their wives and their children and their friends. I'm challenging them, they should come, they should respond. They can't say anything. So at the end of the day, you discover that even those of us who are campaigning for them, who are struggling and uh, putting in words for them, at the end of the day, when they come to power, they sideline you. You have no access to them. You will discover that you are just laboring for some people to, to eat. I was reading this morning on the social media, some people are accusing our president. They said, look at this president, too. those who, who, who put their lives on the line for him, they were not appointed as ministers. I said, is there, is there the ministerial post that is available? Other posts as, see, the only way is to see, to present a kind of governance that is not only acceptable, but seen to be for the people. The government should be for the people, senators should be for the people, House of Rep members should be for the people, council of house, uh, uh, local government I mean, should be for the people, not against the people. Not a governor, not a, a local government chairman, or a senator that will not have answer to. I told that man, I said, when you get to Abuja, let your office here be accessible to us. Don't give anything to this, anybody in this neighborhood in terms of money as you are here to campaign. When you get there, open an office here. Anything you want, you go to that office. We have access to you. See? People don't have, as, as, have access to the people in power. So, at the end of the day, it looks as if the people in power, they are in another world. The people, the, the commoners, they are in another world. If truly those people who are burning houses in Niger, who are stoning the politicians, are the real citizens, is a lesson to politicians in Africa. It, it can happen anywhere. It can happen anywhere. Though people may suffer tomorrow, today they will still clap for these military boys. All right, okay. start, I, I'd like to pose the same question to you, but adding this, that um, now if the one-week um, ultimatum of ECOWAS expires, 
and um, these military boys, like we call them, do not relinquish power. What do you foresee as the next generation? <clears throat> oh, thank you so much. Let me take it from where you stopped, then I'll take your question. Uh, you see, nobody is contesting the fact that um, democracy in Africa has not really been beneficial to the people. It has only been, you know, a few individuals that have you know, getting there, you know, taking over power and using the sources of the nation, the government, for themselves and that of their family. And the quarter cause all of West Africa, you understand. Uh, we've seen, you know, father going away, son taking over, you know, and also happening here. And that's the truth. Uh, the, the democracy has not really been beneficial. It's not people focused, mm -hmm. you know. On that way, too, it's not people focused, and that, that, that's the truth. Another thing is that uh, uh, quite a number of us, people that are here now, they don't understand what democracy means. You see, democracy is a system that has a lot of institutions that wants to make it to work. For instance, if we have an House of Member, an Assemblyman, who is not performing, democracy provides for the fact that you can recall. But what people do when they get into power is that they make it impossible. In other words, if we allow democracy, you know, to work the way it should work, we don't need the khaki boys to help us do what is happening now. Because it is the frustration of the people that brings in the khaki boys. You know, our helplessness. When we make attempt to want to change things and it doesn't succeed. We don't succeed in being able to do it peacefully. He that stops you from doing things peacefully is asking you to do it forcefully. And that's why the khaki boys can say, oh, thank God, we have tried this, it's not working. Maybe with your gun, you can help us to change things. So I want the, you know, the, 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 the politicians to look inward and realize that when they allow, you know, the institution of, um, the institution created for the survival of a democratic system to function, it's to their advantage. I don't know the council of my word. I don't know that you know the council of your word. I don't. I don't. I don't. The last time I the asked, of the, the last time I asked somebody, you should know. Mm -hmm. He said that he knows him, but he doesn't even live in our environment. He doesn't live in the community. The community. Those, those are the kind of problems we are talking about. So when you, when you have the council, you should be the next person to you in the hierarchy, mm -hmm. and you don't even know him. Talk less of feeling or having impact what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of areas we need to look into. But then, apart from that, we don't need a coup if we allow democracy to function and to flourish. Because under a democratic system, we can question, we can ask questions, mm -hmm. we can recall, we can say, no, we don't want you again. These are the things that are not working that has made coup to become an alternative to people of Africa. And it's cut across everywhere in Africa. And I want to equally sound it as a note of warning to people here that quite a number of them are going. When you look at the assembly now, the National Assembly, all our old politicians are bringing their children. Mm. I don't know that you're getting it. In the National Assembly now, quite a number of those of them in the House of Rep, in the Green Chamber, mm. are sons of so so and so. Mm. And they are, they, are adding, they are chairman of this and that mm. committee. Mm. The question we are asking is are they the only one qualified? Mm. It has a constant like hereditary. Mm. My father goes, opportunity, mm. I give it to my son. They should look inward, mm. make the opportunity to spread across for everybody. They're the son of no, no, Mr. Nobody have the opportunity and access. That's why democracy has come. That's the basis why we said democracy is the way to go, mm. where everybody can become there. If, if that kind of a thing also could annoy Nigerians, mm. and they want to say, uh, let's call on the military, mm. um, is it possible in, in, in today, in, in Nigeria of today, for, for coup to happen? Yes. Some people are saying that um, it, could, it only mm. happen in Niger because mm. Niger is a small country, very small. Mm you know, in terms of population and size to Nigeria, and that's why it's easy. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll take that along with this question. Yes. The second part of the question, what happens if um, the ladies' boys says no? For, to people like us, they are boys anyway. Yes. We keep on calling them boys. Mm -hmm. uh, when they, yeah, you see, I know the present president or chairman of the COAS. He knows how to manage conflict. Is a conflict manager, is a crisis manager. You see, as you've said that openly, you start seeing a lot of diplomatic maneuvering going on underneath. For people that they feel these boys can listen to, to talk to them. I'm expecting to see a person, the person of uh, President Modu Buhari being, being asked to intervene, mm -hmm. to talk to these boys and some other leaders 
that they will, they will listen to, they will trust mm. to come in. So I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of diplomatic move mm. coming up on that. Mm. So that I know this is still made. But it's not in favor, it's not in favor of the khaki boys in Niger. Mm. It's, it's not going to favor anybody. You just said it. It's for them in Niger. Mm. We feel it in Nigeria. Ah. Don't, 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 don't forget that. So mm. I see a lot of diplomatic things coming up. You know, move, maneuvering here and there, mm. talking to them. Okay, we'll give you soft landing. We'll do this, etc. I see it coming to, to, to play. But don't forget the fact that recently, Debbie was in Russia. And he went to one, like, we have done what you ask us to do. Mm. We are still supporting you. I don't know when you watch it. I saw it on mm, TV, mm, the mm. clips. So now, on the issue of what happened in Nigeria, mm. Nigeria is a big country. <clears throat> it's, it's going to be easy to have a coup in Nigeria because Nigeria is very polarized on the thick line. But we still have coups. Uh, then, then, when mm. the army was won. The <laughs> army the army, the, okay, the, when the, the army, army has won, been broken. The army has been broken, it's no longer won. And I'll mm. tell you what I mean. Mm. That is why when President Bola met me, wanted to bring about his cabinet. He looked inward to his tribe. People he feels he could trust. The chief of army staff is Langbaja, he's a Yoruba man. Mm. Um, the person that said brigade of guard is Yoruba. The person that's in control of the um, armory in uh, Asuro is Yoruba. Mm. So what I'm saying in essence is, before anybody can say you want to do anything, mm. it will become my tribe versus your tribe. Mm. So it might not be easy for a coup to come up in Nigeria. So it means um, Nigeria will forever be run like that, you know. I am a, I'm an Igbo man, mm. I, I become president, uh, you know, and I have to bring uh, my kinsmen, you know, so close to me, um, you know, because of fear of uh, disloyalty. It's one reality we cannot do away with. Mm. No matter how pretentious mm. we want to sound, mm. yeah, we, we can't, can't do without that reality. Without reality. And that's okay. It. Okay, so closing, um, we've, we've talked about um, the influence of um, foreign countries on mm. Africa. Mm. Now, it, it doesn't mean that um, Africa is now bereft of um, uh, nationalists as leaders, people, men of their own minds, mm. you know, and, and the rest mm. of them mm. who will say no to Europe, mm. uh, who mm. will say no to those influences mm. if, if they come at all. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether you heard about this man, Malema, in South Africa. Ah, mm -hmm. it's one of the parliamentarians. Yes. Yeah, Google it after this program. Mm -hmm. Go and look at the man. It's called Malema. It's a parliamentarian. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh. Look at the man. Then, uh, it's not that uh, Africa is bereft of uh, nationalists, but uh, most of the nationalists who can dare the lion in its den are not given opportunity. <laughs> to hold the of power in Africa. So, and uh, come to think of it, there's no election in Africa that don't have uh, foreign inputs. Even in terms of uh, sponsorship, mm -hmm. releasing money, just giving it one name. It all in an attempt to have an input and have a say in any government that comes to power. That's just it. And uh, look at what happened in Niger. The Vice President of America quickly took up with her phone and called Tinumbu. He couldn't have, she couldn't have called Tinumbu. Certain things would have gone under Of course. Of course. And a, a continent that depends on AIDS from outside will always be ready to say yes to the donors. So, what we have in Africa today is new colonialism. <laughs> so, it is the second generation of colonialism. Pronounced and trained. So, the real nationalists in Africa today, they don't have access to power. Those who have access to power, they have soiled their hands. These Western nations, they have all their CV on their fingertips, their bank accounts, foreign bank accounts, all their, their behind the door their deals. deals. <laughs> so, so how, can, how do you expect such people to fight them? They, can, they will bring out your, 
Yo, do see. Do see. I say, Mr. Man, who is the owner of this? So, 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 it, so it's, really, it's, really, it's really an enclosed wall, mm. you know? It's an enclosed wall. So, no country um, should actually come out and say, I'm clean, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is that the conclusion for us to start? No, no, it's, there's no country in the world that can say we are free. Mm. Like I said, it's a global world. Mm. And uh, because the world is a bit globalized now, or very globalized, extensively globalized, yes. Every, what is happening in one part of the world affects you. Mm. Look, Nigeria should not pay for breakdown of law and order in Niger. Mm -hmm. If that happens, we'll be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because the jihadists in Niger mm -hmm. will now no have control again, mm -hmm. easy access to weapon, and they can easily come to Nigeria. So we should not pay for a breakdown law and order. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to be concerned about what happens in Niger. Mm -hmm. Now, if we push out or we force the out of the place, it's obvious that Basel doesn't have the control of the military or security forces in Niger. And the people already are rising up against him. Mm. So who control? Who brings under control? We should not forget what's happening in Sudan now. So that is why we need to undo whatever is happening in Niger with a high diplomatic sense of, you know, of, of, of what the dexterity, the diplomatic approach to it. And I pray that President Bola Metunubu will be able to find the magic wand that will be able to bring that tension down. At times, it's not always that we must get that person back there. Mm. They, they must look for a way out to ease the tension. And it's not always it. that we should get. But another fear of the world is that if the uranium, if Japanese uranium that mm. is in Niger mm. gets to the end of you know, terrorists, terrorists yeah. that's a fear. Mm. That there will be trouble for the whole world. And that's the fear why America is suddenly very concerned. Mm. And that, look, this must not be allowed to go. But America cannot bring their army. They have their hands filled up mm -hmm. already. They can't bring their army. Knowing the fact that Russia already with Agna Group mm -hmm. has their base, you know, I mean, has, has a, a, they are on ground mm -hmm. in, in, in Niger. These are the challenges. So, mm -hmm. diplomatic approach is still the best way to it. And I'm thinking people like uh, uh, President Mohamed Dubari and some other governors, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the north that have been the border, you know, mm -hmm. town, but the, the states the state that are in the border region mm -hmm. of Niger mm -hmm. should be brought in. They have a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. They can wield mm -hmm. on the people of, of that area. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of things I think we should bring up, mm -hmm. you know, to find solutions in that place. Well, gentlemen, uh, we'd like to thank you so much for coming this morning. It's been a very, very, very um, worthwhile discussion we've had this morning. And um, certainly it's an open-ended topic. It's not one topic you could, uh, you know, uh, exhaust in one hour. So um, we could do a part two of this, maybe, maybe in the days ahead, and uh, as we also monitor developments in uh, uh, Niger. Dr. Bola Babalala of the Moshu Davela Polytechnic here in Abekuta, thank you so much, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Jubilawa, thank you too for your contribution. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, when we come back, we have another guest joining us, and uh, we shall be talking about the NLC nationwide strike mm -hmm. threat. Stay with us. Thank <laughs> you.